So uh, last up before our closing panel session for the day is Huya Atkins, who will present on circular economy thinking. Now, Huya needs uh, little introduction in the circular economy world, uh, but I'll provide a short bio nonetheless. So Huya is a sustainability practitioner who co-creates circular strategy and action. She uses her expertise and understanding of the principles, tools, and strategies of circular economy to help deliver workable solutions that support global sustainability goals. Huya has managed teams across a wide range of disciplines, including planning, policy and strategy development, environmental impact assessment, sustainable construction, and waste management and resource recovery. She's also one of the most dynamic speakers that you'll have the privilege to see. Please welcome Huya. Thanks, Joshko, and shout out to you, sir. I have lost a fabulous lunch break to Eric um, at some time at whichever conference we were at. It was well worth my time to go and spend time with this man. So remember, we don't need perfection, we need commitment and we need passion, and you have that. So head off to the UAE and have a fabulous time. <laughs> So uh, thank you so much to Deep Heard for asking me back again this year. Um, I guess you know that you're saying some things that are resonating um, if you get a second invite. So that is uh, very, a very good thing. Um, I do want to take time to pay my acknowledgement to the traditional owners of the land on which we are on this week of every week. It is important to do so. And I would like to remind everyone that tomorrow at midday is the uh, walk for reconciliation. And I encourage you, I welcome you all to come and join me and many others, I hope, who will be there um, in collaboration, support and allyship with our Aboriginal um, colleagues, uh, family and, and community. Um, I think this is the year that they may need us more than ever. So if that moves you, Please be there tomorrow. So um, I was asked to give a little bit of a, you know, what is a circular economy? I'm hoping that many of us will now understand a lot more about what the circular economy is. But one of the things about the circular economy is it's very large. It's, very, it's a very large, complex, sticky concept. So it often pays to, um, you know, think through it a little bit more and to, to, to hear a few perspectives. So when I talk about what the circular economy is, I really like to help people think about it in, the, in, in comparison to the, the current linear economy that we operate within. Um, and as you can see from the visual here, which I quite like, in that linear economy, we have a huge quantity of new virgin materials being pumped in, used for however long, and then a huge quantity going out the back end to disposal or incineration, with very little coming around and, and being reused in the cycle again. Now, we need to and are moving away from that into this more circular approach where we still have inputs of virgin materials, but far, far less because we've acknowledged and valued the materials already in the system working for us. And we have continued to circulate them. So we are also working then to solve our in fundamental and enormous waste problem. So circular economy is also not just about recycling, as you may, as, may have guessed by now. Many of us are moving on from thinking about circular economy in the waste management context. But there is still, still some thinking to go. So what we know, and when, when we talk about the 10 Rs of the circular economy, what we know in almost every case is that the most amount of impact that we can ever have for the cheapest price is going to be right up the front when we're thinking about how we are designing our products to, to come into the market. So in, in that instance, we are right up the end of thinking about refuse, rethink and reduce, for example. One of the things that we're not so good is at, at, at the human race, is at the avoid point. Do we need it? Why are we purchasing it? 
Why are we wearing that 15th version of whatever it might be? Underwear is fine. Maybe we don't need 15 winter coats, particularly here in Perth. Um, so I think that, you know, what we have been really focused on, and we're certainly picking up here in, in the next slide, is resource recovery and recycling as our main way out of our problems. And that, in fact, will get us nowhere if we don't really bring in these, far, these, these other opportunities, these other business models, which can, which can support our thinking, our product, our innovation, and our capacity to really make that change from the linear to the circular economy. So looking at circular supplies. And we're seeing a lot out here in the, um, in the, the centre room um, around new opportunities for supplies, around packaging, for example. We've just had four great presentations. Um, so that we are actually bringing in supplies that can be circulated. They are, in fact, designed purposefully to be circulated continuously in the system. Product life extension is also another one there. How can we keep using what we have? And we already have incredible examples of that. For example, um, uh, Caterpillar now have a, uh, a second um, part of their business called Cat Reman. And this is not new. This is actually what we've done for hundreds of years when we're looking at heavy machinery, for example, bringing that machinery back up to spec to keep it going and keep it useful, rather than buying a new version of it all the time. That part of Caterpillar's business has trebled in a really short period of time. There is a huge global market for this. Um, sharing, sharing platforms are another critical part of, of the puzzle. And we're seeing this happen at the neighbourhood level now. We're seeing tool libraries. You know, I, I personally love my little local book library where, you know, it's a, and I don't know if you've seen them, they're, they're neighbourhood. They're on people, the front of people's houses. You can go and open, open up the little door, take out the book that you might want and replace it with another book. These are really, really simple ways of reconnecting to our community communities and moving these resources through in a shared way. Um, and product as a service. Do we need the light globes or do we need the light that they provide? What's actually the most important thing there? Do you want the light globe and then the burden of the waste at the end or do you just want light when you need light? This is a question that's been asked around the world and most often the answer is not really interested in dealing with, you know, 50,000 dead light globes at an airport, for example. Skipole Airport now have lighting as an airport, uh, lighting as an airport, lighting as a service. They no longer are responsible for light globes. They have a partnership agreement and their lighting is maintained to the highest quality standard in the most sustainable way possible with a partner who provide that lighting. Everything is tracked. The minute a light globe goes down, Skipole Airport do not lift a finger. That is monitored by their, their, their partner. Um, Signify in this instance and Signify come out immediately and address the issue either remotely or on site. Talk about a great service. So this is actually product as, as a service in action and can really, really benefit in terms of keeping a whole lot of products out of the market that are not actually needed and just end up as a waste product. But you still get the part of the service that you need, which is the light. So moving on, what can the circular economy actually offer? It can offer a lot. So a reduction in costs, purchase less, use less, waste less. There is actually a capex cost in so many of those areas for businesses. If you are not using it, why buy it in the first place? If you are, if it's ending up in waste, do you need to rethink your initial purchase? So there are a lot of ways to actually reduce the cost within your business up front. Um, Stabilising material supplies. COVID, through our lockdown periods, hopefully gave us a really, really good shake up as a globe. We're beginning to understand what can happen to our global supply chains pretty much overnight. I mean, if we'd been told that our entire 
um, you know, international air fleet was going to be grounded, um, you know, in the coming three months, people would have thought you were completely bonkers. But that's actually what happened. You know, I mean, we will always remember, you know, the 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 toilet, the great toilet paper shortage of 2021, when we all had to worry about whether we would be getting toilet paper at, at the supermarket. And in fact, you know, we were experiencing, um, you know, the great wall that 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 Mark McGowan built us to keep us safe also um, presented great challenges. We had significant barriers to getting our our uh, remote workforce into our state. To um, you know, uh, a lot of our FIFO workers in the mining industry are coming from other parts of Australia or New Zealand or internationally. It was very very difficult to get them in and out. So we were at real risk of some parts of our economy grinding to a halt. So we needed that shake up. We need to learn from that shake up. This is possible and we need to be stabilising our supply chains in a local and resilient way going forward. Also presents us with revenue opportunities. So to actually maximise the use of underutilised resources. We all have many resources that are sitting around at home or in our businesses that are underutilised. What about if we could share and, and, and create the opportunity to essentially create a second revenue um, opportunity there? Uh, product repair and manufacturing and product as a service, as I mentioned, is really swinging up. Um, I was at an event last night where we introduced a partnership between Good Samaritan Industries South Metropolitan TAFE, uh, their fashion school, and the recreation and teaching of the essential skills around repair, remanufacture, and, and upskilling new fashion students in how to do those things. I, you know, as I was talking to South Metro TAFE, they were saying every fashion student who wants to come in wants to be a fashion designer. Now, we're not telling them that that probably is highly unlikely for the vast majority of you. Where you will get work is in having those basic skill sets that you can apply where it is needed. The fantastic thing about the partnership between Good Samaritan Industries, South Metro TAFE, is that Good Samaritan Industries and many other charities are experiencing an incredible, as, we, as many of you may know, an incredible um, amount of increase in volume of donations. Everyone from the bottom of their heart, you know, coming from a good place, is dropping off so many more clothes now. Two thirds of what you drop of, of what is dropped off volume wise uh, is either ending up in landfill because it cannot be repaired, or it comes in, um, you know, it might need a new zip, a new button, a new hem. There is no one to do that work. And so a third of what could be going onto the shelves is also going to landfill. So good Sammies are working with creating and, and driving these new skill sets to actually shift that third back onto the shelf and getting it into the sale and wear cycle. So sometimes it's those simple things, but when you think about the system as a whole, it's having a very significant change. One of the things that's really important to know, and you will already have been talking about this earlier today, is the intrinsic connection between net zero and circular economy thinking. We are very, very focused on carbon and energy at the moment, and for good reason. No judgment here. However, that is one part of a much larger picture. What we know is at the global level, if we could, if we could, manage 100% of our energy needs renewably, we're still only just over half the way of where we need to go. That's still a huge chunk. And these strategies are, you know, like, sorry, so 45% continues to be locked up in that product material um, cycle. So once we've, we've stopped looking at scope one and scope two, and people are starting to get their heads around that at the moment, scope three will be coming to the fore. And everyone in this room is part of somebody's scope three. So if you don't think this applies, I'm sorry to tell you, it really does. And it is coming downstream to you and your businesses sooner than you think and probably sooner than you would like. So this is something that, you know, you need to be starting to think about. 
how is the product that I am creating and selling back to whoever it is that you're selling to, a major in particular, how am I going to be called to account for what I'm producing as a manufacturer or a producer and the impact that that has in somebody else's uh, supply chain? One of the things that uh, came uh, has come down very recently. So in the last sort of four to six weeks, if you're in the circular economy space, like myself, it has been a rapid fire, super exciting period of time. There have been so many international and, na and national drops of standards, interim reports, you name it. We are squarely in the transition. Uh, it's a lot on this slide. What I want you to know fundamentally is, if you don't know already, we have a circular economy ministerial advisory group of industry uh, national um, experts that is directly advising Tanya Plibersek and a variety of other members, uh, other ministers, other federal ministers, because obviously there's a lot of connection and overlap between uh, this and uh, this portfolio and their portfolios. So the key thing here to understand is our federal government is well across the circular economy transition and our federal government is working out how we start to do that. So this is not a buzzword that will be going away. This is a transition that we are on. Three quarters of the G20 already have national circular economy plans and just to highlight that for you, 40% of Australia's exports are to those G G20 companies, uh, companies uh, are to those, those G20 countries. So if you're in the export business, you need to be thinking about your products and how you're feeding into this, this wider agenda. Um, now, as I mentioned perfection before, we don't need to be 100% circular. That's not what we're going for here. That is incredibly difficult. I'm not gonna see it in my lifetime. But what we know is that the Centre of International Economics has highlighted that a 5% improvement in our efficiency could add $24 billion to our national GDP. That is mind-blowing, absolutely mind-blowing. And DECU, our federal agency, has estimated that businesses spend $104 billion to send $26.5 billion in material value to landfill. Just going to let that float there for a minute. Like, I don't know about you, but that act, that physical, I have quite a physical reaction to that. That is just toe curling for me. Like staggering that we invest so much as businesses to put so much more, and yes, it was billion, not million, into landfill. So this stuff is bonkers, right? Absolutely bonkers. So we are being left behind, but we are working very hard at the federal level to catch up, and it will trickle down. So we are on the journey. Now, I feel like some of my examples are going to pale in significance to some of the ones that we've got out there, and I'm thrilled about that. So I'm going to go through these super quickly. Um, let's just take one, one of many. Um, I love wool packing as a great, as a great concept. Um, this, new, this new option looks at taking non-textile grade coarse wool, which was in fact a waste product on farms, replacing cold, uh, uh, replacing styrofoam to package cold um, items. It's biodegradable, it's compostable at home, it's reusable, and it valorises a waste product. This keeps um, pharmaceutical products cold enough, seafood cold enough, meat cold enough. Super cool way to valorise waste and a great uh, you know, end, end product. Um, many more there. Um, we've heard about wine, not ever going to touch on that. Um, food sticker alternatives. I mean, food stickers, there's a huge argument for them in the food industry. I'm personally not a fan, as you can imagine, um, for a whole range of reasons. We have alternatives that we can be moving to now. 
Brewer's grain as animal feed, grape mark. The research is demonstrating that grape mark may even be more effective at removing meth at, at managing uh, greenhouse gas emissions greenhouse gas emissions in cattle than seaweed. There's some core and you know seaweed's getting a lot of attention right now. Um, hospitality are doing some incredible things. Uh, Melissa Palinkas on the far left, chef uh, in East Fremantle, doing incredible things with a zero waste and virtually zero plastic kitchen. If you know how to replace um, the sous vide plastic, uh, please get in contact with her. She needs your solution. Um, this uh, fruitful collaboration. This is a UK example, but I did decide to bring it anyway because I want to show you what's possible. These two companies, very unlikely bedfellows. Terra Nitrogen produce nitrogen products and methanol. They've built a pipeline to John Barter, who grow tomatoes, one of the largest tomato growers in the UK. Um, a byproduct from Terra is over um, 12,500 tonnes of CO2 per year and waste heat. They pump that into the tomato growing um, business and they have uh, significantly reduced emissions, created 65 new jobs and um, 15 uh, million, what is it? Used to be pounds, at pounds it was, uh, in private investment into the region. So here are some incredible partnerships that work really well. So very, very quickly, how can you get involved? I'd like to introduce you to Circular Economy Western Australia, CIWA, of which I'm the chair. It's a not-for-profit and we are driving collaboration and networking across the whole of the circular economy space. We are, looking, we are wanting to create a hub for people to come and have the conversation and be a part of understanding how uh, the transition will affect you and how you can benefit from it. Um, final thoughts are the circular economy is not recycling on steroids. I think by the end of the day, we should all probably know that by now. It's not, and it's also not a set process. The circular economy is a new way of thinking about how to create value and new outcomes for everyone involved. Um, start with the low hanging fruit. Meet your neighbour. What do you have that they have? What do they have that you have? Create those collaborative partnerships and understandings. Um, don't do it alone. Collaboration is key to some of the biggest to, to resolving some of the biggest challenges that we uh, find ourselves in today. So thank you all, and um, I'm with Josh on the panel. So I'm sure I'll get asked more questions. Thank you. Grab a seat. Go straight across.